we're now going to go over a bit of a review of linear functions. So first off, we're just going to define linear functions, what the graph looks like, the table, the equation, all that stuff. So a linear function describes a quantity that changes at a constant rate. And that constant rate we've actually talked about so far is called the slope. And then the graph of any linear function, as we can see down below, has the shape of a straight line. It is one of the more basic or straightforward functions that we will see and that you can come up with. So looking at the table and just thinking of slope and this constant rate of change throughout the context of each of these different representations of the function, we have the x values are just counting up by one each time. So from two, negative two to negative one, that's up one. From negative one to zero, that's up one. So as we increase the x values by one, we can see how the y values change. So we go from five to three, well, that's negative two. From three to one, that's negative two. And that's what we mean by the quantity changes by a constant rate, is that in the y values, you're changing by or adding or subtracting the same amount from one step to the next. And so the change in the x is just one, whereas the change in the y's is negative two. And this is the essential idea behind slope. So we've talked about before, slope is described or found as the change in the y's divided by the change in the x. You can also think of it as rise over run is often the terms that are used to this. And it describes how the graph changes when describing the slope. And we've also seen slope as a more algebraic or analytic point of view where the change in the y's we say is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, where we have two points, x1, y1, and another point on the line is x2, y2. So we just need two points on the line. So the slope here, the change in y over the change in x is the change in y in the numerator, that's negative two, and the change in y in the denominator, that's one. So the slope here is negative two. And then to find the slope in the graph, it's best to just look and see where are nice points on the graph, or just any two points on the graph. So we see here, there's a nice point on the graph here, and then there's another nice point on the graph down here. So we count and see what is the change in the y's. So if we count down, this should be a change or going down by eight. And so since the direction is down, that means it's a negative value. Since down is a negative action on the xy coordinate plane, this is negative eight technically. And then we see we went down eight, and then how much do we go to the right to get to that next point? Well, if we count, this should be we go to the right four. And since going to the right is a positive action on the xy plane, right? Val x values to the right are positive, x values to the left are negative. The four here is considered to be a positive four. And then also we could choose any other two points and say, oh, we're going down two, that's negative two, and then we're going to the right one, that's positive one. So the slope here, that rise over run, is down eight, that's the rise, is negative eight, and then the run going left and right is the four. And then we can simplify that to negative two, which we already found the slope to be negative two. And then we can identify what the slope is in the equation as it's just the coefficient on the x. That's the multiplier that you have on the x. And that does make sense for when we're subtracting two each time. Essentially what you're doing is if you increase the x by one, you subtract two, and that's what the negative two out front is doing. So the slope here is negative two, it's just the coefficient on the x. And then some of those properties that we like to talk about with functions, the domain range, behaviors, increasing, decreasing, x-intercept, y-intercept. So let's look at the domain. For a linear function, you can plug in any x value, and you're not going to break the rules of math. You're not going to divide by zero, you're not going to take the square root of a negative number, etc. So the domain is all real numbers or from negative infinity to positive infinity. And the range is the same thing. It goes up and down forever. So the range is negative infinity 
to positive infinity. You can get any number out from a linear function. And then the behavior, increasing, decreasing, constant. If we look at this graph, read it from left to right, follow along the line. Left to right, the graph is going down. So this one is decreasing. And we've talked about increasing, decreasing in relation to slope before. Remember that a function is decreasing if it has a negative slope around that area or over an interval. So, so this is decreasing because it has a negative slope. And the x-intercept on this one, it's kind of hard to see. So, you know, maybe it's just halfway there. In fact, it, it is halfway. Remember, the x-intercept is where the line crosses the x-axis. So the x-intercept here is 0.5. Or you could write it as a point and say 0.5. 0. And the y-intercept, if we look where the line crosses the y-axis, that's right at that height of 1. So the y-intercept is y equals 1, or you could write it as a point zero one. And so I mentioned this when we were talking about the behavior of the graph and on the unit where we were looking at rates of change and slopes increasing, decreasing, where if the slope is positive, greater than 0, then the function is increasing. And then on the other hand, if the slope is less than zero, if it's negative, then the function is decreasing. And it never changes from increasing to decreasing because it always has the same slope everywhere. It's a constant rate of change. So there are many ways to represent a linear function in an equation form. And some forms have benefits that the other forms don't have, and there's some pros and cons there. But first and foremost, the one that we're most familiar with most likely and that's generally taught to us is the slope intercept form, which is y is equal to mx plus b, where the m is the slope we've already talked about, and the b is the y intercept. And so when we're writing the slope intercept form of a linear function, and we're just writing the general equation of it, we always you know, use y and x as the variables. So all we need are the m and the b, the slope and the y-intercept, to write out the equation of the line. And then the other form, which is the point-slope form, it is written as y minus y1 is equal to m times the quantity x minus x1. Now I know that this one looks like there's a lot more stuff going on and it seems a little messier, but this is actually, I think, the nicer form to work with. Because we have the m is the slope, like always, but then the y1 and the x1, that is a point on the line. So we have x1, y1 is a point. It's a point on the line. And so for this one, all we need is just the slope and then some point on the line. It can be any point on the line, and we can write the line in the point-slope form. The slope-intercept form is a little bit more restrictive. You need a specific point. You need the y-intercept. But for the point-slope form, you can just use any point on the line. And if you're asked to write one of the forms, the names of the forms are actually descriptive of the objects that we use in the equation. So slope intercept form, well we use the slope m and then we use the y intercept, the b. The point slope form, use the slope, the m, and then you also use a point, the x1, y1. So one thing that we want to be able to do is to be able to fluidly go between the different forms and try to figure out if we have some information about a line how can we turn it into other information and turn it into a different form? So another form that we could look at that's usually a little bit less used, at least in our class, is this standard form. And so if we have this line 4x minus 10y is equal to negative 150. This is called standard form, and the general way it's written is ax plus by is equal to c, where x and y are the variables, and then the a, b, and c are values. So if we have 4x minus 10y is equal to negative 150, let's locate the y-intercept and the x-intercept. So thinking back about y-intercepts, to find the y-intercept, we let the x value or the input be 0. 
because looking at the graph, I'm going to scroll up, looking at the graph, the y-intercept, that's where we're looking for when the line crosses the y-axis, and the y-axis has an x value of 0. You don't go left or right at all. You only go up or down. So anything along the y-axis has an x value of 0. So we're plugging 0 in for the x value, and then we solve for y. So we have our standard form equation. So 4 times input minus 10 y is equal to negative 150. So you put 0 into the input, and then you go and solve for y. 4 times 0 is 0, so we have negative 10 y is equal to negative 150. And then you get y by itself, divide by negative 10. Those divide to 1, and then divide by negative 10 on the other side to make sure we do the equal action. And then we have y is equal to 15. So what this is telling us is that the y-intercept is at the height of 15, or it's the point 0, 15. And then for the x-intercept, it's the same thing. Along the x-axis, the y-value is 0. You don't go up or down at all. You only go left or right. So we're saying the y-value is 0, so we just plug in 0 for y and then solve for x. Pretty much the same process, but just using the different variable. So we have 4x minus 10 times the y, which is 0, is equal to negative 150. And now we want to solve for x. Negative 10 times 0 is 0, so we have 4x is equal to negative 150. And then get x by itself. We divide by 4. Those cancel or divide to 1. Divide by 4 on the other side. And we should get that x is negative 37.5. Or the x-intercept as a point is negative 37.5. 0. So now we want to take the linear equation in the standard form. It's the same equation. We're going to write it using the slope-intercept form. So that's our goal is to write the linear equation in the slope-intercept form. Now we did actually just find what the y-intercept is on the previous example. However, let's do this algebraically. Let's say maybe we weren't able to find what that y-intercept was. So we have y equals mx plus b. That's the slope-intercept form. So an another way that we can do this is take the standard form and then just solve for y. We want to get this equation that we have here and make it look like the equation we have as y equals mx plus b. So we just solve for y. So writing out our standard form, it's 4x minus 10y is equal to negative 150. We want to solve for y. So we got to get rid of the 4x here. Those subtract or add to 0, so subtract 4x on the other side. And then we're left with negative 10y is equal to negative 4x minus 150. And then get y by itself. We divide on the left-hand side by negative 10. Those divide to 1. So we divide by negative 10 to everything else on the other side. So then we have what's left over. y is equal to negative 4 over 10. This can be simplified. So we have two negatives. So negative divided by negative, that's going to be positive. And then we have a 4 in the numerator, 10 in the denominator. So this can simplify to divide both by 2. And we have 4 turns into 2, 10 turns into 5. And then on the other one, negative 150 divided by 10. Well, that's a nice number. That's 15. So this coefficient, this fraction here, turns into 2 over 5, x. And then since this one was negative divided by negative, it's going to be positive now. And it's 150 divided by 10, which is 15. So this is the line in the slope-intercept form. So it'll often be the case where you're just starting out or you're given just two points on the line. Or you can just see the picture or the graph of the line. And you have to figure out what is the equation of the line. First you can figure out in point slope form or you can figure out in slope intercept form. So I think it's easier and, more, and a better process to start in point slope form and then go to slope intercept form algebraically. But first, no matter what form we put it in, we need to find the slope. So to find the slope first, we want to use the y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So we're going to find slope over on the side here, and we have 
the slope is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And it doesn't matter which one we label x1, y1, or x2, y2. We get the same thing at the end of the day, but let's just label this x1, y1, x2, y2. So those are the two points we have. Now let's solve or find what the slope is. So y2, we said that's 8, minus y1, that's 4, all divided by x2, which is 5, minus x1, which is negative 3. So we're subtracting negative 3. So in the numerator, we have 8 minus 4, which is 4. In the denominator, we have 5 minus negative 3. But we have a negative minus a negative. So this is positive. And this is all over 8. So the slope at the end of the day is 1 half. So there, we have the slope. Now, to use the slope and what we have already to get in point slope form, let's just rewrite what the point slope form is. This is y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1. And so point slope form, we have the slope, that's the one half. And then we have a point on the line. We actually have two points on the line. It really doesn't matter which one we pick. We can pick whichever one we want. But let's use the first point. So we have y minus y1, so the y part of the point, that's 4 is equal to 1 half the slope times x, that's the variable, minus x1, which is the negative 3, but we have negative, negative, so that's positive 3. And that is all we have to do for the point slope form. So that's why I think the point slope form is nice, because we didn't really have to do any extra algebra or solving or any extra steps like that to get it into the point slope form. All we needed was to identify and find the slope, and then to identify a point on the line and then just put in the different parts of the point slope form. But now for the slope intercept form, we can go from the point slope form and use algebra just like we did the standard equation up above and then get it into the slope intercept form. So remember slope intercept form is y equals mx plus b. And so what we're essentially doing is we're solving for y. And when we solve for y, we get it into that slope intercept form. So solve for y. Let's take our original y minus 4 is equal to 1 half times x plus 3. So to solve for y, we have this minus 4 on the left hand side. So we want to get rid of that we add 4. So then we add 4 on the other side. And then we have y by itself here. And this is equal to 1 half times x plus 3. And then plus 4. Well, we solve for y but it's not quite in that right form that we want it to be in. So what we want to do is we want to expand everything out and then combine like terms. So we have this one half out front here and it's multiplying the x plus three quantity. So we want to distribute that one half in and then combine like terms with the four outside. So we have y is equal to one half out front plus three times one half, three times one half is three halves plus four on the outside there. And so off to the side, let's do this three halves plus four. So we have some extra space, three halves plus four. We're adding fractions, so we wanna get a common denominator. You can think of four as four over one. So to get a common denominator between two and one, we multiply the one by two, but then we have to do the same thing in the numerator. So we're really multiplying by two over two which is one, so we didn't break any math rules, it's all still legal. And this is equal to three halves, nothing changed there, plus two times four is eight over two times one is two. So we're doing denominators are the same, add the numerators, so that's 11 over two. So this three halves plus four is 11 over two. So to write all that out, we have y is equal to one half out front still, plus the 11 over two. And so I know that you're familiar and comfortable with the slope intercept form, and that's what you've used in past math classes. However, I think the point slope form is much more streamlined. We, there's very little algebra and room or places that you can make mistakes in the point slope form. For the slope intercept form, we have a lot of different ways of making mistakes to get into that slope intercept form. So we always have to be a little bit more careful when using that slope intercept form. 
And now we can just review graphing linear functions in first off the slope intercept form. And so in the slope intercept form, so what we do is we start with, we plot the point that we have, which in this case is the y intercept. So we have the y intercept here of negative two. So let's plot that point negative two as the y intercept that's right here. And then we use the slope. Slope is rise over run. Remember that. So the y intercept is negative two. And then the slope is rise over run. So up and down change versus left and right change. That's two over three. So what we do is we start at the y intercept and then we go up two. So I'll draw the dotted line. We go up two and then we go right three. And so we have another point right there. So we went up two and then we went right three. So we have this point and then we connect the dots between those points. However, we could get more points from this. So what we could also do is start with that y intercept and instead of going up and to the right, so positive, positive, makes sense, the slope is positive, we could go down two and left three because then that's a negative action with a negative action, but then that becomes positive because it's a negative divided by a negative. So we could go down two and then to the right by three and get another point. So down two, that's negative two, and then left three, that's negative three to get another point on there. And then from there, we just kind of connect the dots and kind of continue through. If you have a straight edge or a ruler, you can use that to continue your line. So now we can look at some problem solving that involve linear equations. So let's say at a local circle K, a 32 ounce soda costs 79 cents, while a 44 ounce soda costs 99 cents. Assuming we have a linear change in price, we want to figure out what we'd expect a 52 ounce soda to cost. So first off, when we have a situation like this, I think the most important thing is to identify and define your variables or identify what are the changing quantities that you have. So we have some numbers floating around. Those numbers are measuring the size of the soda and then the other numbers measuring the cost of the soda. So we want to think about which one would be the X and which one would be the Y? Or think about independent and dependent. So with the soda ounces and the cost of the soda, you would assume that the cost of the soda depends on the size of the soda. So cost depends on size. And since cost depends on size, then that means that cost is the dependent variable or the Y and size is the independent or the x. And so we could think of it as points, right? We have the, this relationship between the 32 ounce soda and that goes along with the value of the 79 cents. So you could write it as a point, 32 ounce soda for the 79 cents. And then we could have another point, the 44 ounce soda is associated with the cost of 99 cents. So there's this very direct association between the cost and the size, in this case with the 44 and the 99 cents. So then the change in the y's compared to the change in the x's, that will give us the slope. So the change in the y's is the change in the cost, the 99 cents minus the 79 cents, which is 20 cents. And then the change in the x is the change in the soda size, is from 44 ounce to 32 ounce. And then that would give us 12. So now we can reduce this fraction, reduce the slope a little bit. In the numerator, this is 20 or 0.20. And then the denominator, it's 12. So we can divide each of these by four. So divide the denominator by four, that gives us three. Divide the numerator by four, that turns it into 0.05. And then this gives us the slope is in the numerator, this is dollars 0 0.05 and then the denominator, this is three ounces. So that, that's the slope, that's the M. And so with these in context or these like problem solving questions or problems, you can always interpret the slope in relation to the context.
So here this is saying that the price of the soda will change by five cents when you change or increase the size of the soda by three ounces. So let's say the cost will increase by five cents for each increase of three ounces of soda. So here we want to write an equation for this situation to model this change in soda price and soda size. And I know I write here y equals mx plus b. Let's write it in both the point slope form and the slope intercept form just to get that extra practice in. So let's write out what we have. We have the slope or the m is 0 0.05 over 3. We also have the points we just listed up above. We have the points 32 and 0.79. We also have the point 44 and 0.99 or 99 cents. And so to turn that into the point slope form, So remember that point slope form is y minus y1, and we can pick whichever point that we want, doesn't matter. Let's just pick the one on the right here. And so that point slope form is y minus y1, and so that's coming from the point, and we can pick either point, doesn't matter, let's just pick the first one. The y on that point is 0.79, is equal to the slope, the m, which is 0 0.05 over three, times x minus x1, the part of the point that's the x value, which is 32 in this case. And whenever we're plugging into the point slope form, we always have to make sure that the x1 and the y1 match up and they're part of the same point. So here we, we got in the point slope form. There you go, that's an equation. But let's turn it into the slope intercept form. So to turn it into the slope intercept form, we wanna get y by itself. To get y by itself, you add 0.79 to both sides and so when you add 0.79 there, what we have at the end of the day, let's also distribute that 0 0.05 over 3 and see what we get. So we have y is equal to 0 0.05 over 3 times x. It's not much to do there. It just becomes the coefficient on the x. And then 0 0.05 over 3 times negative 32. Let's see what that is using the Desmos calculator. And so in the Desmos calculator, what we're doing is 0 0.05 divided by 3. And we're multiplying this by negative 32. So if you want to put the negative in there, you put the parentheses, negative 32. Or you can just put in the positive values and then remember that there's a negative attached. And then so we should get negative 0 0.533 repeating. So we have here, when we multiply the 0 0.05 over 3 by the negative 32, this is negative 0 0.533. It's repeating. We'll just round it off there. But then we have the plus 0 0.79 on the outside. So add 0 0.79 to the negative 0.53 repeating. So we have y is equal to 0 0.05 over 3x plus 0 0.257. So this is the slope intercept form. We also had the point slope form. I'll give that a dotted box because that is a partial answer to this. We are getting an equation here. So there's kind of two answers or, or two equations that we could write. We could also put in the standard form, but we'll just leave it as is. So now we can use this equation to predict things or predict values about the situation, about the context here. So if we are trying to figure out what we, we would expect a 53 ounce soda to cost, what this is telling us, a 53 ounce soda, what we have to think is that an input value, is that an output value, or in this case, is that a size or is that a cost? Well, it's a size. So X is the size, the independent value. So this is saying X is equal to 53. And then from here, we just plug 53 in as our input into the x value. So we have y is equal to 0 0.05 over 3 times x, but that x is 53 plus 0 
And so we can throw this into the Desmos calculator. We have 0 0.05 divided by three, hit the arrow key going over times 53. And then we're adding onto the outside of that, the 0 0.257. And this is what we get as our solution. This is the output. We just simplified all the stuff on the right hand side using the calculator. So we get 1.14. So y is approximately, because we are technically rounding, because we have to divide it by 3, 1.14. And this, remember, we always have to make sure that we remind ourselves of the context. This is in dollars. So a 53-ounce soda, we expect to cost $1.14.